Hey, Professor Robert here, and we're going to get into Chapter 4, Asset Allocation, Risk Tolerance Questionnaires and Investment Policy Statements. This is an introduction to it for you, and try to give you a little bit of more insights uh, from my own experiences a little bit. All right, so again, it's a great day to learn something. Yes, all right, just to review, uh, companies need money, and where do they get that money? They, they go out and they get investors. Uh, who own stock in the company, and they also seek out loans from investors through bonds. Right? Stockholders are called equity owners, and stocks are also called equities. Right? Both bondholders and stockholders expect an adequate return for their investment, given the amount of risk that they are taking on. Yeah. So again, we have asset classes, uh, stocks, bonds, or fixed income investments, Real estate and cash are typically the four major asset classes, but sometimes real estate is grouped in with a whole big broad category called alternative investments. Here's just another breakdown. You can break down, for example, stocks by large company stocks and small company stocks, international stocks, foreign developed markets, foreign emerging markets. You can break down bonds by U.S. government bonds or corporate bonds. You can break them down by how long a maturity they are, short term versus intermediate term versus long term. And you can actually create hundreds of different asset classes out there, all right, just by breaking down big asset classes into more and more uh, different ones. So as, what is asset allocation? Well, it's a very important decision that every investor has. It's basically, where are you going to put your money? Are you going to put it in stocks, bonds, cash, real estate, or some other asset class? How, what percentage are you going to put in that? And how do you do that? Well, you determine that by basically how, how long until you need this money. All right. And then, for example, if, if you need this money next year, you should not be putting it in stocks. In fact, if, in my view, if you need this money anytime within the next 10 years, you probably should not be putting it in the stock market. All right. It also goes to what is your appetite for risk? Are you are really willing to take on a lot of risk, potential losses in your portfolio to get those long-term gains that can come from owning stocks uh, and or is you have a very low risk appetite or tolerance for risk, in other words, all right? So here's just an example, all right? Here is somebody who's 20% fixed income investments or bonds, all right? But the rest, 80% is in stocks, 10% of their portfolio is in large company stocks here in the United States. Another is using a lot of factors that we're gonna be studying, uh, the small cap or size factor, the value factor, which is also called the price factor, profitability and investment factors. So a big part of their portfolio is in that. 29% of it is in foreign developed and emerging markets, which is basically stocks that are headquartered in overseas. So that's, that's another asset classes there. And then again, with factor tilts that we'll be studying. All right. So this asset allocation is the most important decision that an investor has and most investors get it wrong, unfortunately. So how do we determine what asset allocation is? Well, one of the ways of determining that is by asking investors a lot of questions to determine what's called their tolerance for risk, their risk tolerance. Can they emotionally handle the market going way down and way up, a lot of ups and downs in the market? And that's basically what risk tolerance questionnaires are designed to do. And these can be several pages long. They can be computer driven with 100 questions. They can be on paper just with 10 questions. So there's a lot of different risk tolerance questions. There's a lot of different software programs out there to do risk tolerance with. So what's interesting is most of these questionnaires measure risk tolerance, which is the willingness of an investor to take on market volatility and stay invested. But risk capacity is also important. Basically, it's your ability to have something bad happen. For example, if you were 100% stocks and you were age 65 and about ready to retire, and this, we entered a Great Depression and the stock market went down 80% or 90% in value, wow, that's probably not a good thing, all right? So your capacity to take on risk, given where you are in life, what might be such that you need to be more conservative. We also have to look at the need to take on risk. Uh, so, you know, a 40-year-old client who has 20 years to go wants to be more aggressive in all likelihood. Can they tolerate the decline of the market? Yeah, so that's something 
I had to have a lot more discussions with her about. So, uh, and this need to take on risks is actually not given, in my view, not given enough emphasis uh, by practitioners and academics and, and the like when we're talking about risk tolerance and risk capacity and things like that. So these risk tolerance questions, in my view, they, they're not really all that great. One is most of them don't ask enough questions, and the questions they ask are kind of poorly worded, maybe not understood very well. Different people under certain different terms differently. Also, they don't the answers reflect the client's recent history. Now, if I gave my my own clients a risk tolerance questionnaire uh, at the beginning of 2022, after the market was doing really well, okay, their risk tolerance would likely be pretty high. I gave them one after the end of 22, when the stock market was down probably 20, 25%, and we had high inflation, their risk tolerance would likely be lower. Right? Uh, it can also actually take into account their own mood on that particular day, uh, their emotional state on that day. Also, when I meet with the client for the first time, I, if I gave them a risk tolerance question, I'd probably get one set of answers. But after I meet with them several times and I've explained how the capital markets work, how stock work and, and why it's okay to take on the volatility of the stock market given what their goals are and, and our need to achieve these goals. And we look at that volatility and after I educate them, their risk tolerance can become higher. And, and again, most of these risk tolerance questions really don't take into account the need to take on risk, which is a very important factor. So the kind of the, my approach with client is, first I wanna say, where do you need this money, all right? Now, that's not a certain answer. We know that things can come up in life that, be, that alter when people need money. Uh, and we try to take that uncertainty into account, all right? Uh, what, how much need do we need to, how much risk do we need to take on to accomplish their goals? And also, and is there a significant variance between what we need to have as an asset allocation, maybe it's aggressive, versus their risk tolerance, which we would indicate that is not very uh, aggressive? If so, then I need to discuss their risk capacity with the client. And, and one thing that I do this with clients is, I say if the stock market fell 80% of value and didn't recover for another five to 10 years, what would you do? And actually, one of my favorite questions to clients is right before we implement, right after they've agreed with everything, is say, if we do this today and the stock market falls 40% tomorrow, what are you going to do? Are you going to adhere to the plan that we have in place, which means we're going to buy low and sell high? Or are you going to kill me? <laughs> of course. Uh, so. And if they come back and say, you know, I would fire you, then I say, well, we've got to have more talk then, right? Because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And what happens tomorrow is fairly much unpredictable. New news could come out, all right? But we need to have a plan for what happens to, regardless of what happens tomorrow. If the market goes way up or the market goes way down. Yeah. So we have this problem. Uh, and dealing with investors, uh, whether you're your own investor or you're giving advice to clients, that humans really aren't wired for this. All right, they're not. You know, the, the, they look at things that happen in the market and they make a whole bunch of mental errors. Uh, they're called, for example, I should have seen that the market was coming, or my research confirmed that this is a great stock to own, kind of that's called an overconfidence bias or an overoptimism bias or something like that. So um, a lot of a lot of problems and we'll study behavioral finance in a bit. Uh, we also know that many investors follow their emotions. Hey, prices have gone up. People are feeling good. They say, hey, let's put more money in the market. And then the market goes down and they get very fearful and they want to pull out of the market. They effectively do the wrong thing, which is buying high and selling low instead of my favorite four words in investing buy low sell high yeah repeat after me buy low so high yeah. <clears throat> so how do we how do we get investors to stick with a plan well we got to put that plan in writing and that's called an investment policy statement it sets forth the goals of the client maybe what their current investments are what strategy we're going to use what asset allocation we're going to have and who's going to monitor it, who's going to make changes and the like. 
Investment policy statements can be one page long, they can be 40 pages long, but most of them are probably somewhere between three and 10 pages long. So, and, and there's all different types of them. There's software out there that have financial advisors can use to generate investment policy statements. Or in my case, I draft it my own because it's, it's very unique to my own investment philosophy. Typical statements would be, what are the objectives of the client? All right, what are your goals? All right, when do we need this money? Uh, how much do we need? What are we trying to achieve? And then we just get into what asset classes are we gonna use in your portfolio and which ones are we not gonna be using? There's a lot that we may not want to be using. And then we set up the asset allocation, how much we're going to put in different buckets, how much in different asset classes, all right? And then who's going to monitor it? Typically, a lot of portfolios are monitored on a quarterly basis, but some are monitored with software or basically daily, all right? And who's going to make changes to this investment policy statement? Maybe people get older and we need to make a change or something happens in their financial situation that makes a change. Uh, they take on a new job or they have a, another child unexpectedly and it changes uh, basically what their goals are, or what their needs are. You know? So again, enjoy the day, enjoy the readings, and I'll see you on the other side. Thank you.